Well, you guys have been asking for it for a while, and the day is finally upon us. Today, I'll be taking you on the grand tour of my private gym space, and I'll show you all the pieces in here and tell you a little bit of the backstory behind how and why this all came together. There's a lot going on in this video, so you'll find timestamps below, and let's get stuck straight into it. Before we go through the gym section by section, where I'll break down every single piece of equipment for you and why I've selected the things that I have for this space, I wanted to start with more of a general overview on the background as to how this space came to be. Most of you on here won't know much about me whatsoever, other than me being some guy on YouTube or Instagram who posts a bunch of content. And considering that the majority of you only started following my content less than a year ago, I might have seemed to have cropped up out of nowhere, and you're left with the question of, how on earth did I get this gym space, and what do I actually do? So, I started out working in the fitness industry in commercial gyms as a personal trainer back in 2009. And I was doing that for about seven years, growing my business into a little bit of online coaching and running a few small workshops out of the commercial gyms that I worked from. Then from the four years from 2016 through 2019, I started touring nationally around Australia and then around the world, running hands-on educational workshops for personal trainers, coaches, and physical therapists in the US, Asia, Canada, New Zealand, Europe, the UK, and just about everywhere in between. Through nearly all of 2018 and 19, I was living out of a suitcase, and I'd been in a different city just about every single week with my workshop tours. Teaching, especially hands-on teaching, is probably one of my favorite things to be doing. There's something so rewarding and fulfilling about being able to have such a positive impact on people's lives and improving their understanding, not just on training and nutrition, but how to take care of their health long-term and to pass that on to other people. There were, however, a couple of big issues that I started to run into with traveling and teaching so much. First of all was the gym spaces that I'd be using to run my workshops from. Finding a gym that checked all the boxes that I needed to be able to run things the way that I wanted to be able to provide the most value was proving more difficult as my workshops grew. And it wasn't just about having enough room to be able to house all of the students, but to also have all the pieces of equipment to be able to teach and demonstrate everything that I wanted to, as well as enough pieces to be able to run practicals for everyone to be able to get a hands-on experience of what was being taught without having these humongous bottlenecks where everybody would be gathered around the one squat rack or the one lap pull down for an hour to be able to use it for all of about maybe 20 seconds. And finally, and most, probably most importantly, I needed somewhere that was able to be closed off or made private in some way for the entire 16 to 20 hours of the workshop, as it can be extremely disruptive to gym members to have to work around a full practical workshop being conducted on a gym floor, and incredibly disruptive to the students to have to work around members and to try to learn from a demonstration with loud music blaring on the gym speakers. So while you might be thinking of a few different gyms that you know of locally where you are in the world, you'll probably be hard pressed to find any that tick every single one of those boxes. And that is the exact frustration that I'd be dealing with on the road. I'd be welcomed into so many incredible facilities all around the world and I'd be able to make it work for the most part, but I'd always finish an event thinking to myself, if I only had this piece of equipment or more space or even something as simple as better acoustics in the place for sound management, it would have been a far better experience. So I'm not gonna hijack this video with all the different horror stories and funny tour stories from all of those years. Maybe I'll do that in another video down the road if you guys are really interested to hear some of those. But it was all enough for me to start to realize that I was being really limited by not having the ideal space to be able to create the experiences that I wanted. The other thing that was starting to push me towards my own space was the growth of everything that I was doing. When I started touring in 2016, I struggled to fill 10 people into a workshop in Australia. But by 2018, I was selling out entire tours, seeing thousands of people all over the world, with extended wait lists and still not being able to fill the demand of several cities and countries not being able to fit into my schedule. 
By then, I'd launched Gambaru Method, which served as my online educational platform to be able to share my content with all those people who couldn't come to workshops. And I wanted to find a way to make that content an even better experience for all the members on there. So my website, Gambaru Method, simply started as a place for me to house all the recordings from my workshops on the road and maybe a few extra pieces of content that I'd be filming in these different gyms on the fly. But I wanted it to be so much more. I wanted it to be a platform where I could conduct lectures and workshops and where I could make purpose-built content and deliver programs and workouts that put all of the educational content into practice so people from all backgrounds could benefit from it. Whether I simply wanted to blindly follow a program as a general training enthusiast and trust that it catered to their needs, or they wanted to understand all the details that go into making a program like that, I wanted them all to know that they could be covered. And it was around the start of 2019 that I realized that I was actually costing me a lot more money to not have a space than to have a space. There were countless times where I'd be going to film some content, but then have to deal with lazing with another gym to shoot at, and then coordinating times with a videographer or athletes and setting everything up, only to get to the shoot and have members in the background or have a loud gym environment that I couldn't record audio at, or certain key pieces of equipment were missing or being repaired or being used by members. It was all incredibly frustrating to me. And the more I thought about it, I'd have really been having these issues since I first started filming my content back in 2013. Though obviously to a much lesser extent. So that was it. I decided to start searching for a space of my own. And I found one that looked appropriate, this space here, in the middle of 2019 when I was still on tour. I got everything sorted from overseas and started getting all my renovation and equipment plans in place through the rest of the year. And everything started to come together at the start of 2020. As you can see, it started out as an empty shell. It needed a complete rework to create the mood, ambience, and style that I wanted from a creative space. To not just be another big warehouse that had a bunch of equipment thrown into it, but to be somewhere that I'd be excited to come to, that would be calming, focusing, and allow me to create the content and experiences that I'd always dreamed about. So without further ado, let's take a look at some of the main features of this space and the equipment that I've chosen and why I've put things together the way that I have. First of all, and something that most of you won't even realize as being as important as it is, is the acoustic treatment to this space. So the ceiling is completely lined with acoustic foam and the main feature wall also has acoustic foam behind the wooden slats. One of the biggest gripes that I would have with a lot of the gyms that I'd be going to was the acoustics of the premises. I'm not against loud music or the clanging and banging that happens in gyms on the whole, but there's nothing more off-putting and distracting than the echo and reverberation that comes from a typical open space where sound is free to bounce off everything. There have been several gyms that I'd go to around the world where it'd be difficult to simply cue my training partner or instruct a small group of students, not because of the loud music, but because of the way that sound travels in a wide open space. We'd have to yell just to be heard at a conversational level, even though we'd be standing just a few feet from each other. I would see gym owners spending tens of thousands of dollars on the best speaker systems money can buy, but it would all sound like absolute trash because the acoustics of the gym were just plain terrible. So in here, despite it being a full-scale warehouse, the acoustic treatment creates a similar sound experience to a warm and inviting living room as opposed to a loud, echoey warehouse that you get lost in. So next up, we have the center stage here. This platform, which is sitting under the giant halo light. This is a full-scale, four-meter by four-meter lifting platform. I want to let this size initially because I had a concept to make it a convertible platform between the carpet flooring for powerlifting to a wood platform for Olympic lifting and finally for my tatami mats for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. After going through some of the designs, though, it didn't seem as feasible to do the wooden platform, so I ditched that idea but retained the size as it broke up the space really nicely to make everything seem a lot less cluttered. From an aesthetic design perspective, one thing that I've grown to appreciate over the years is open space. If you look around this gym, you can see I can easily fit a lot more equipment in here. But not only would it not necessarily be useful for me from a pure usage perspective, but it would also take away from the open feel to this space. It helps to create the overall ambience. 
Similar to a bedroom or workstation, a busy space creates a busy mind. And I wanted to make this as much a stress-free zone as possible. It was also really important for me to keep as much open space as possible, purely from a filming perspective. I didn't want to just make everything fit on the floor plan. I had to make sure that from a video or workshop perspective, there would be unobstructed views to all the important features of each piece of equipment. Another question I get regularly is about my brand name and logo. Gambaru is a Japanese word that loosely translated means to slog on tenaciously through difficult times and striving to not just be or do your best, but to become more than your best. To me, it captures the continual pursuit of improvement, which is something that I think just about everybody can resonate with. Nothing in this life comes easy, and it's a huge undertaking to push yourself to grow into whatever development it is that you're striving for. The Gambaru G is based upon the concept of squaring the circle, which is an unsolvable mathematical problem, which is a metaphor for trying to achieve the impossible and for bringing together two things which are generally thought of not being able to exist together. And I resonate with that because a lot of my background in training didn't come strictly from bodybuilding or from one source. I would learn from bodybuilders and powerlifters and exercise physiologists, but I'd also learn from dancers and martial artists and singers and acrobats to develop my view of the training world. For me, Gambaru is not just about following one system rigidly, but being able to draw from a wide variety of backgrounds, as there is nearly always going to be something useful to learn from somebody else. All right, so let's move along now to some of the fun stuff, the equipment. Most of the pieces here are from Atlantis and Prime, with a couple of select pieces from Cybex, Nautilus, and Hammer Strength. I'm not going to go through and deconstruct every single piece and all its nuances individually, as that would drag out what's really going to be a long video into an even longer one. But if you are curious to see more of my thoughts around specific pieces of equipment and why I chose them and why I like them over the others, let me know in the comments section and I'll create some more specific equipment overview videos in the future for you guys. I also do think it's necessary to mention that as a rule, I never accept any endorsements or paid advertising from any company, whether it's fitness brands, supplement companies, clothing, or anything in between. I paid for all the equipment here out of my own pocket and hand selected everything that I use in this gym. If I'm using something, it's because I stand by it, not because I'm paid to do so by the company. Just in case you're wondering whether or not this is gonna be a humongous ad for a certain equipment manufacturer or anything like that, it's not. So the main fit out came from Atlantis, which out of all the equipment that I've used, Atlantis has always stood out to me as the best all rounder. There is still yet to be a brand of equipment supplier that does everything perfectly, including Atlantis, but they did check a lot of the boxes for just about everything that I wanted with the basic pieces of kit, like your seated rows, lap pull downs, and isolation leg machines. They also go the extra mile with their design and engineering to think of things like foot plates for short people and to create extra long designs so you can get an extra stretch without bottoming out the weight stack. They also made a couple of my personal favorite pieces of equipment that not many other companies make, the high cable row and the pendulum squat. I've reviewed both of them before, so I'll leave links to those in the description box below. They also make what I believe to be one of the absolute best 45 degree hyperextension benches on the market due to its height and adjustability. From an overall engineering perspective, the cables and all the pin-loaded machines from Atlantis are extremely smooth and robust. You'll see I also have a free motion functional cable station that I use a lot. And while that does offer a lot more from a customization and versatility perspective, the load capacity of the cables and the overall strength of the machine is pretty poor. I actually broke one of the cables with my first couple of uses on that machine, trying to set it up for a cable press. And I've heard a lot of other people having similar issues with the piece needing regular maintenance. So the free motion still does get the job done as an adjustable cable station for me for my personal use, and I use it every time that I train, but I do wish that Atlantis made a functional cable station instead. So right here under the bright lights, we have the leg aisle. I've got Atlantis calf raises and old Cybex leg press, Nautilus glute drive, Atlantis pendulum squats, Cybex hack squat, and a Cybex Smith machine. Now to most people, a leg press is a leg press, or a hip thrust is a hip thrust, or a hack squat is a hack squat. But to me, details matter, 
and small differences in things like the angling of the foot plates or the back support or the size of the foot plate or the length of the back pads or the position of the safeties all go a very long way to not just make it a more comfortable machine but to allow you to set things up appropriately. There are options on the market that allow you to customise these things, for example adjusting the angle of the leg press bench or the foot support or anything like that, but I've found most of the options either didn't actually match up nicely, even with the adjustments being made, or they fell short on things like comfort or the overall engineering and the strength of the machine as a whole to make it usable long term. Moving across now to the opposite side of the gym, we have all of the isolation leg machines. We've got an assisted Nordic curl, a seated leg curl, lying leg curl, leg extension, and an abduction adduction machine. All of it is from Atlantis, except for the abduction adduction machine, which is by Prime. I actually purchased that piece, not because I use it a ton, but more so as a teaching tool for the adjustable cams. Now, without going too far off track on a nerdy tangent and boring you guys to death, Part of how pin-loaded, cable-driven machines work is via what's called a cam, or these weirdly shaped things here. So as you go through whatever exercise it is, the cable wraps around the cam, which, due to its weird shape, alters the distance that the cable is from the pivot point of the machine. This alters the resistance placed upon your muscle through different points of an exercise. An equivalent way to think of it is to imagine doing a biceps curl with a dumbbell. If you did the dumbbell curl with your arm by your side versus with your arm in front of your body in more of a concentration style or with your arm behind your body in the incline curl style, the dumbbell still weighs the same, but it's placing more resistance on your biceps at different points of the range of motion. Cams are doing the exact same thing on cable-driven machines. And the unique thing about Prime is that they allow you to alter this on the same exercise. So you can do the one movement and apply more stress on different positions of the range of motion for the same exercise. But yeah, I really don't use it that much personally. The other pieces of equipment that I got from Prime are these two plate-loaded rows. When it comes to machines in a gym, I think the two body parts you really need to think about are legs and back. Arms, shoulders and chest, for the most part, can easily be hit with cables and dumbbells. But legs and back are far harder to cover completely without machines. So this is an entire back aisle. So again, I went with Prime here because of the adjustability of the grips and for the different weight pegs. In a similar fashion to how the cams work, where you place the plates on these machines will dictate what position of the row is harder or easier, which is a very valuable thing to be able to manipulate for training. There will be times where you want it to be more challenging at the start of the range of motion versus the end of the range of motion. One isn't necessarily better than the other, but having the option to alter it is extremely important. And that's also why I got the hammer strength row up in the back, because I think it's a horrible piece of equipment that I actually never use, but got more so to be able to teach on and to highlight how some equipment manufacturers, even with a big brand name like hammer strength, can go so far wrong. Between the position and angling of the handles, the converging and diverging nature of the handles through the range of motion, and the way that the weight moves through space as you go through the range of motion, that is one quite poorly engineered piece of equipment. It can still be hacked into a far superior exercise that is useful from a muscle building perspective, and that's the real reason why I have it, to demonstrate how to use a lot of the biomechanics principles that I teach to get more out of less. Next, we have these upper body machines here. These are all first generation Nautilus, which if you've been around the gym game for a while, you'll be familiar with the impact and influence of the Nautilus brand and Arthur Jones. Brief history lesson for those of you who care, Nautilus were the first company to introduce the whole cam system that I was talking about earlier. All of these cogs and chains are designed to create the perfect resistance for your body to work against through the entire range of motion, eliminating any easy spots. To be honest, they did miss the mark on a lot of pieces with that, and even these pieces here aren't necessarily the best machines on the market. I use the rear delt fly machine quite a bit, and the trisus machine occasionally, but the others serve more for teaching and demonstration. These two in particular, the upper chest or front delt fly and the upper back fly, are both in theory great pieces of equipment, but because you're forced into these extremely abducted positions instead of a more tucked position, it winds up cranking a lot more on your joints than doing anything productive for your muscles.
So again, these pieces are here more for demonstration and teaching purposes, as well as looking cool and paying respects to a lot of the history of modern resistance training that we know today. Now, one thing you may be thinking is, Eugene, where's the squat rack or power rack as the big centerpiece piece of equipment? While I do have one, I barely ever use it. Because over my years in the industry, the more that I learned about biomechanics and training as a whole, the more I came to realize that barbells are incredibly convenient and versatile as a training tool, but they're not really essential. And I'm now at a point where I only really use them for deadlift variations. Obviously, if you're doing powerlifting or Olympic lifting or other barbell-related sports like CrossFit, you need to incorporate barbell exercises and get good at them. And a power rack or a squat rack will be an essential piece of equipment for your training. But if your goals are more general and they're to build muscle and to build strength that is non-specific to barbell sports, just about all barbell exercises can be replaced with dumbbell, cable or machine-based exercises for far superior results, or at the very least, the same results with less side effects, like soreness, joint pain and general fatigue. It's probably one of my most unpopular opinions, but when you look into the fundamental principles of biomechanics, mechanical tension and fatigue, it starts making a lot more sense. It really does come down to what you have available though, and in my case where I have what I need available to work towards my goals here, I don't see much of a need for a barbell for things like squats, presses or rows anymore. So the rack that I do have is the first piece of equipment that I purchased back in 2015 when I was training out of my mum's garage. This Alico Combo Power Rack. I always believe in buying quality and you only have to buy it once when you do that. So when it comes to barbells, plates and competition grade equipment, Alico is the gold standard. I have a full set of bumper plates, a weightlifting bar and a powerlifting bar from Alico, all of which I've been training with since 2015. The last thing we have here are dumbbells. These are all from Ivanko and go up to 170 pounds, which I of course have personally never touched beyond unboxing them since I don't even weigh 170 pounds anymore. The dumbbells are probably the one thing that I was really nervous about getting because they're such an expensive item. I knew that I didn't want the typical rubberized or polyurethane dumbbells you see in a lot of commercial gyms because they just don't have that feel that I grew up with and I think they're just plain tacky. Beyond the pure design, you also need to consider the width of the handle and the knurling coarseness. Ivanka have been leaders with creating dumbbells for years and have kept true to the style of steel dumbbells with an incredibly comfortable width and knurling that doesn't need much wearing in at all. So they were the first option I went for and I'm incredibly happy with them. So finally, the most common question I get around this gym is, is it open to public and can people come to train here? At this stage, the answer is no. This space was created with the sole purpose of functioning as my creative space to be able to make the best possible content and experiences for you. Most days, I'll be here filming or brainstorming content or just plain tinkering around to continue to experiment with everything training related. And to open it up to members would start to limit that creative process. So there you have it guys, a full look inside my headquarters. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video and a big thank you to all of you who have been there from the early years when I was just getting started in the fitness industry. There's a lot more content to come from me in this space, so I'll see you all next time.